We're going to start this morning with our two presentations, um, starting up with Eddie Talosevich from the National Churches Trust, and then we're going to have Becky Payne, and we'll do the same as yesterday, we'll have the two presentations back to back, and then we'll have a chance for questions and discussion, and then the discussion's going to continue in the main hall with everyone in uh, slightly different groups. So, Eddie, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as you heard, I'm Eddie Talasevich, I'm Head of Communications for the National Churches Trust, and I'm very grateful for the organisers for having selected this paper for presentation. Um, yesterday, uh, there were some extremely stimulating papers delivered. My paper is perhaps a little bit more modest. I will tell you a bit about the National Churches Trust, explain our work in helping churches as they attempt to become Domus Ecclesia, or perhaps um, community hubs, and then briefly describe a project we part funded at St Egbert's Church in Vista, which you can see up here on the slide. Um, there are a lot of bodies with the words churches and trust in their title. The Churches Conservation Trust, the All Churches Trust, indeed the National Churches Trust was formerly the Historic Churches Preservation Trust. It can at times be confusing. Um, the National Churches Trust, we are a registered charity and our main charitable objectives uh, are to promote and support church buildings of historic, architectural and community value across the UK. We aim to achieve this by mainly providing financial grants to repair and, dare I use the word, modernise church buildings. And we do a few other things, supporting projects to help churches remain open. We work quite closely with local churches trusts and volunteer bodies, providing practical advice, support and information, and working also to promote public awareness about churches. And I'd echo what Lloyd Grossman said yesterday after dinner about the need to get out the message about churches. And one example of our work was in 2013, we ran a project called the UK's Favourite Churches, where 60 well-known people, um, from David Cameron downwards, or perhaps from David Cameron upwards, chose their favourite churches. Um, this helped to show the wider world that churches are loved by many people of faith, and also those without faith. Uh, Michael Palin uh, chose his favourite church, and he's a good example of uh, he describes himself as an agnostic with, with doubts. Um, he's someone who loves churches but is not a believer. As I mentioned, our forerunner charity was the Historic Churches Preservation Trust, um, whose functions we have taken over, and we also took over the functions of the Incorporated Church Building Society, which was formed in, in 1818, and that body was responsible for funding many of England's Victorian churches. As we heard yesterday, there's talk of a Royal Commission being set up to look at the future of churches. It may be of interest to know that in 1950, the Church of England Assembly, which is now the General Synod of the Church of England, established the Repair of Churches Commission to decide what should be done about the problem of the poor state of repair of English parish churches. <coughs> and that resulted in the creation of the Historic Church of Preservation Trust, which was registered as a charity in 1953. Um, for those uh, uh, with a historical interest, the first secretary and executive committee chairman was Ivor Bulmer Thomas, and uh, the role of secretary was then taken over by Hugh Llewellyn Jones. Um, the trustees uh, included John Betjeman and uh, still today Lord Cormac. Today, what's unique about the National Churches Trust is that we support church buildings of any denomination that are members of churches together in Britain and Ireland, and we cover the whole of the United Kingdom. It's not an easy task for a very small charity based in London. We don't own any churches, and we only support churches that are open for regular worship. We're not an evangelising body. What goes on in a church is entirely up to that church, but it must have regular worship, however that's defined. Uh, we receive no funding from the government or from church authorities, and our income is derived from individual donations and from trust foundations and from investment income. Since 1953, we've helped around 12,000 churches, chapels and meeting houses with grants and loans for repairs. We're a small charity, but every year we've, been, we've given pretty much the equivalent of one and a half million pounds each year in grants to churches. That's adjusted at today's prices. 
When we started, we were one of a few grant makers. Today, of course, much more money is available from the HLF or the government through the Roof Repair Fund, etc. Now, one point to note is that we fund unlisted places of worship as well as listed places of worship. Um, we are, as I said, one of very many trusts today that churches can approach for help in funding projects. The Historic Churches Preservation Trust, as the name perhaps implies, mainly funded fabric repairs and in churches that were deemed to be historic. Whereas the National Churches Trust, we're a bit more down market perhaps, we, we find that more and more demands are placed upon us for funding the installation of what are called community facilities. And our funding of the installation of these facilities is perhaps changing the appearance of many parish churches. But with the right architects and design, we think the impact of community facilities can be extremely positive, both for the physical fabric and the life of an individual church. We've identified these projects in the last few years as a priority area, and uh, we are, with lawyers, unlocking funding that was previously restricted for fabric repairs so that we can fund more of these community projects. Why is this so? Well, perhaps it might just be worth, before going on to, to BISTA, to, to hear from the words of a church uh, we awarded a grant to yesterday, and that was a small grant for £5,000 to the Church of St Andrew, Andrew in Warmingford, Essex. It's a Grade 1 listed building, and we're helping to fund the creation of a kitchen and an accessible toilet. And in the grant application, the Church told us, we are aware that worshippers and visitors travel to the church from some distance and express surprise that we are unable to offer refreshment or comfort. It is less than helpful to suggest that visitors walk at least 500 metres to the nearest amenities with toilets and these may not be open. Our mission to attract young children and the elderly is being severely hampered by the lack of facilities including toilets, baby changing or running water. We know that some parishioners have elected not to attend the church due to the lack of facilities and are aware that couples who qualify to marry in the church are choosing other venues because of the lack of facilities. The Essex Association of Change Ringers has ceased using our church for bell ringing events due to lack of toilets or the ability to wash hands. The inability to provide simple refreshments in church prevents us from demonstrating Christian hospitality. So that's sort of from the coalface. Um, there are, as we heard yesterday, well we didn't hear yesterday, we heard how many Church of England places of worship there are in England, but there are an estimated 42,000 Christian places of worship in the UK. Many of those are listed. Um, we heard yesterday about the importance of these buildings as both places of worship and as historic buildings. But church buildings need to play an increasingly important role in providing community facilities. That's partly because churches want to serve their own congregations and the wider local community more effectively, but also because the state is withdrawing from so much activity. Last month, Harringay Council in London, London announced that it would be closing all its community centres. And Oxfordshire County Council has said uh, recently that it will be closing all of its family centres. Churches are clearly a place where these activities can take place. In 2010, we conducted a major national survey on how the UK's church buildings are maintained and funded and how they contribute to their wider communities. The survey was open to all Christian places of worship and around 9,000 places of worship engaged with the survey. The message of the survey was extremely positive. Church buildings are essential both to the UK's heritage and to the vitality of towns and villages up and down the country. In addition to holding religious services, the survey estimated that nearly 80% of church buildings are used for other purposes, uh, including community activities, and nearly half are used for cultural activities, including arts, music and dance. Church buildings are significant venues for volunteering, and the survey estimated that more than 40% of the UK's church buildings, this is in 2010, were being used for supportive counselling services on issues such as homelessness, drug use, finance and debt, parenting and mental health. The survey found that although many church buildings have key facilities, there is much room for improvement. It estimated that nearly a third of the UK's church buildings had no toilet facilities 
and that listed buildings were generally the least well equipped. Many church buildings lack adequate heating or tea and coffee, coffee making facilities. Those which do have these basic facilities are much more likely to offer additional community activities. If demand from churches for community facilities is not enough, there is also support from the public for this. Last year, we commissioned an opinion poll on attitudes to church buildings from the polling company Congress. A sample of 2,000 people from all around Britain were surveyed online. 87% of people uh, taking part in that survey agreed that churches and ch chapels should have good access and modern facilities such as toilets to make it easier for people to use them. The importance of providing facilities, I think the case has been made, uh, such as toilets and kitchens, is a key way in churches can remain at the heart of local communities. That's why, since 2008, we have, in addition to running a repair grants programme, we've been running a community grants programme. Since 2008, we have awarded 178 community grants, totalling around two million pounds. Funding is modest, it can be as high as £20,000 or as low as £5,000. Applications for the grants are assessed by our Grants Committee using the following criteria. Benefit. What is the social benefit of the proposed project? Design quality. Has the impact of the project on the building <coughs> been considered and challenged? Stakeholder participation. What planning, organisation and coordination efforts have or will be carried out by the place of worship to maximise the project's chances of success? And attainability is very important. Is the project actually attainable? And will our grant enable the work to be carried out? There's no point giving money to a church where it's unlikely that the money will be spent in a two or three year time period. A prime example of a place of worship benefiting from a community grant from the National Churches Trust is this church of St Edberg in Bicester in the Diocese of Oxford. Bicester, for those who don't know it, is a growing market town and it is perhaps increasingly well known not for the church of St Edberg, unfortunately, but for Bicester Designer Outlet Shopping Centre. And partly due to that, it is one of the fastest growing towns in the UK. St Edberg dates from the 12th century and the church underwent a restoration from 1862 to 1863 with the help of G.E. Street, about whom we heard yesterday. The church applied from a community grant to the National Churches Trust in 2013 with a plan to install two toilets, a servery, and to repair the floor at a level to enable disabled access. This, in fact, was the second phase of a major reordering project which started with redecoration and rewiring. And there will be another phase, money permitting, which will involve removing pews and putting down an entirely new limestone floor. It was mainly through the arrival of a new vicar, the Reverend Canon Teresa Scott, that the reordering project was taken forward. She saw that it was important to update the building for modern usage as part of a broader mission to serve the community better. The total cost of this stage of the reordering, including the fees, was just over £200,000. When the church applied to us, they had a funding deficit of £40,000, having already raised funds from Landfill Tax, Wren and Viridal, Oxfordshire Historic Churches Trust and the Listed Places of Worship VAT grant scheme. We awarded them a modest grant of £10,000. Uh, led by the architects, uh, well this is a view here which perhaps shows where uh, the work is, was due to start here at the West End. This is where the servery uh, was going to be installed and this is the West End with a font where the toilets uh, were going to be installed. And uh, this is the toilets here more, more specifically. Um, so the toilets were installed in the form of baptistry um, and you can see here with the font in the northwest corner of the church. The medieval font was moved to enable the space to be converted. Not only was this the only suitable <coughs> area for toilets to be installed, but the church felt that the repositioning of the font um, meant that the font could be more visible because it was rather hidden uh, from the rest of the church. <coughs> the, the original Edwardian, you can see here, panelling in the baptistry was reconstructed 
um, to form the new screen across the alcove. The door to the toilet lobby is new, but was made skillfully, so it is impossible to distinguish between new and old. Subsequently, two toilet cubicles, one with disabled access, and a storage cupboard were fitted out with oak doors to match the outer door. A local heater for hot water in the wash basins was located in the storage cupboard. The whole toilet area has a flat ceiling to prevent sounds or odours escaping. An old suspended wooden floor across the rest of the West End area was removed, exposing the bare earth beneath. Other tiled areas of flooring were also removed, as was the font, uh, its stone plinth and the parquet flooring around it. The lime creek floor was then laid with the appropriate substrata and underfloor heating was incorporated at this stage. And finally the floor was finished with Cretan limestone floor tiles. At the other end of the church, at the southwest corner, a servery was installed. Um, and as you can see here, this comprises a double sink, refrigerator, dishwasher, undercounter cupboards and a water heater. The worktop is corian and the woodwork is oak. The whole blends well with the colouring of the stone floor and is not obtrusive. For safety reasons, the worktop encloses the complete area and the only entrance is via a half door which can be bolted from the inside. In addition to these works, a complete programmable heating system has been installed in the tower, replacing the existing unreliable and uncontrollable boiler, which was located in a dark, damp cellar. Outside, a foul drain has been laid to connect the toilets with a public sewage system, and a water mains connection has been installed, whilst a gas supply main has been repositioned to supply the new boiler. The most striking, uh, uh, visually striking part of the project was the relocation of the font, um, which is now on a small plinth in the centre of the West End, under the impressive, you can just imagine it here, uh, tower arch, and in line with the altar. The tiling pattern under the tower and in the chancel was replicated uh, around the font. Uh, finally, wherever possible, materials have been recycled. The pine parquet flooring, some pitch pine floorboards, many of the Minton Victorian floor tiles and some supporting bricks uh, were all sold for domestic reuse, while the stone print of the font was kept on the architect's advice for future use in the church as the stone is of high quality. Um, now we can move on to the celebrations, um, and you see them being opened, and uh, Sir Tony Baldry is the local MP, um, which is probably helpful for the church, and perhaps even for the National Churches Trust, as he's now moved on to uh, be something great and good in the Church of England. Um, uh, the project was completed in 2014, and the <coughs> celebrations took place in July 2014. The aim of the church was always to attract a wider range of users. Therefore, the PCC developed a marketing and management strategy designed to encourage a greater variety of users, ranging from commercial interests to community organisations. In particular, the church has told me that the provision of toilets in the church is increasing attendance at events, and the improvement in heating is beneficial to attendees and is obviously a welcome feature during the winter. In the first few months after the project was completed, the church has been used for adult concerts, a photographic exhibition, a fair trade AGM, three children's concerts organised by the Rotary Club and a number of school groups. The font um, uh, is, is interesting uh, because it allows full use of the font with people clustered around. It's become a bit of a sort of spectator sport, I suppose, in full view of the congregation and without fear of the priest falling off the high plinth and, um, and uh, it's, it's in, in, in great demand. The church, uh, and this is the, the church's words, I think from the vicar, the stunning visual impact is beyond our expectations. It links the west and east end in a manner which is both aesthetically and liturgically pleasing. The standard of craftsmanship has been very high throughout, but especially in the tiling and carpentry. Some small but significant details were done by the contractor in a way which enhanced the final result and other improvements to the design were made during the job as a result of their suggestions. Their attention to detail and their desire to deliver an outstanding end project were evident in all that they did. Many people have been impressed by the quality of the toilet installation and much praise has been forthcoming from the congregation and visitors alike. As I said, St Edberg's has already drawn up plans for the next phase. 
which is the raising and relaying of the nave floor and the same stone as the west end, together with underfloor heating to this area and improved all-round access. Costs are high and the challenge is to relaunch the vision to the congregation and fundraise in an increasingly challenging environment, made even more challenging for St Edberg's by the discovery of the need for urgent stone wet repairs and a new drainage system discovered at the last quinquennial inspection. Perhaps I'll end um, with uh, uh, two things. One, um, there is an excellent book um, written by my colleague who will be speaking, uh, Becky Payne, Churches for Communities, which looks at how in Oxfordshire there have been a lot of projects similar to this, and there is a description of the project at St Edberg's. Unfortunately, I believe it's out of print, but it may be available. No, it's not out of print, it's just, I don't know. Ah, it's not out of print. <coughs> Even better, it's not out of print, so you can get hold of that. Uh, so that's number one, and perhaps it might be useful to, to realise that uh, this, of course, was a, a spiritual endeavour, and a prayer was written um, uh, by the Reverend Maggie Durrant, and used regularly uh, during, uh, uh, during the project by the parish. And um, I'll just read that out and um, we might want to reflect on the words. <clears throat> Dear God, we remember with gratitude those who built, repaired and adapted St Edburgh's church for over 900 years. As we work to tackle the building challenges of our generation, we ask for your grace and hope. We ask for courage and determination. We trust in you to enable us to deliver work worthy of the place where we worship and serve you, almighty God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.